Hello, Dr. Michael Greger. Thank you for being on Veggie Channel again. We are in uh, London uh, for the VegMed uh, 2019. I just would like to ask you how you became vegan. How this is possible in the life of a physician? You know, it's actually all thanks to my grandmother. You know, I was just a, a kid when my grandma was sent home in a wheelchair to die with end-stage heart disease. She already had so many bypass surgeries, you, you just get so scarred up inside. There's nothing more they could do. Could find a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. How old were you? Oh my God, so I was like nine years old at that point. And, uh, and then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. It talks about Francis Greger, my grandmother. They wheeled her in and she walked out. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on the spine until age 96 to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went to medical school in the first place, why I started nutritionfacts.org, why I wrote the book How Not to Die. I just wanted to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. So let me understand, when you started your um, classical studies at the university, did you already know about the possibility of being vegan? Oh, absolutely. So I already knew okay. that these, many of these chronic diseases that were wiping out that were plaguing the Western world were reversible. Yet I remember being in a lecture saying that, uh, um, uh, with, where a medical professor saying that you would die if you became vegan. If a patient that you literally couldn't live, and I'm like, I, I don't feel dead. But we met many physicians that be started being vegan after they finished their studies. Oh yeah. How do you think this is possible? So if you go to these kind of conferences and you ask people what did it for you, the most common answer that I've gotten, and because obviously you didn't learn about it in medical school, is they've actually learned about it from a patient. And so all of a sudden, one of their patients that they've known forever comes back to them, and all of a sudden they've lost weight, they're, they need to be taken off their diabetes medications, or I mean, their blood pressure's down. They're like, wow, what did you do? Everything's great all of a sudden. And they say, well, I saw a fork soap and knives, or I you know, read the China study, or something that inspired them. And then, in the back of their mind, the doctor's thinking, I've got a thousand patients just like you, right? Um, and that often starts them on the journey. And for me, as a scientist, that's frustrating. I was like, wait a second, I've got a mountain of evidence I've been trying to tell you, and one little anecdote, one patient, and all of a sudden you're changing your whole practice, but that often what triggers them looking into the science, and they realize that they what they haven't been taught, um, and then oftentimes it changed your entire practice and to this lifestyle medicine using lifestyle approaches like diet, not just to prevent disease, but to rest and reverse it as well. It's quite funny because when we speak with a classical physician and we say there is literature, scientific literature that you should be aware of, and they say, yes, yes, I know there is, but that those studies are not good are second, I mean, second quality studies. So anyone who knows the literature, that's not the response you get. Because we're talking about, for example, Dr. Dean Ornish's Lifestyle Heart Trial, published in the most prestigious journals in the world, The Lancet, um, follow-up five years later in, in the Journal of the AMA. These were randomized, controlled studies. That, for people who are actually aware of the literature, the response you get is, yeah, yeah, I know the science says, you know, this is the diet that would reverse the number one killer of my patient population, but my patients won't do it. I can't even get my patients to stop smoke. There's no way they're going to give up their burgers or whatever. And so, but that's this patronizing attitude that they somehow, they are making the decision up for their patients and they don't know if the, they should at least inform the patients. It's their bodies, their choice. If they want to keep smoking, well, then that's, a, that's up to them. But they should at least be told, be informed that if they continue to smoke, it'll significantly increase their risk for lung cancer. If they continue to eat food X, Y, and Z, these are the predictable consequences of their actions. Last question. If you have a physician that is starting to get information and would like to, to know, where would you advise him to go? to get the first important literature. There's a fantastic website, nutritionfacts.org. Obviously, we have an army of translators, mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a cadre of Italian translators that go through and, and, and subtitle in Italian. The book is available in Italian as well, How Not to Die. I really think it's a good 
place to go. Yes. Um, and so, I mean, that is the source I wish I had as a physician. Oh, no, there's an Italian translation okay. of How Not to Die. Absolutely. No excuse. No excuse. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. See you again.